Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 10th Philippine Geographical Society or PGS lecture series for 2022. This is brought to you by the Philippine Geographical Society in partnership with the U University of the Philippines Department of Geography. I'm Oni Martinez and I will be your host for this event. This afternoon, we are grateful to have with us a distinguished alumnus of our department share with his vast experience as a humanitarian geographer highlighting some of the humanitarian activities in the ASEAN region and how geographic knowledge and perspective are applied in each undertaking. Just a few reminders before we proceed. Kindly keep your microphones on mute during the presentation of our speaker. We also encourage you to interact by typing your comments and questions in the chat box. They will be addressed during the open forum. Uh, we also have a slide though for this particular session. Um, so the link will be uh, posted here in our Zoom chat or chat box. Uh, let us know what you think about uh, today's activity and uh, the lecture of our speaker. And you may also direct your questions using the link. This lecture is being simultaneously streamed in the Department of Geography YouTube channel. Also, please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be made available for viewing after the event. I know you are all eager to hear from our presenter, but first, let's learn more about what our participants had in mind regarding the topic for today's lecture. Everyone, please welcome uh, our president, Eman Garcia, to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Oni. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. I am delighted to welcome everyone to the 10th PGS Lecture Series for 2022. Um, for those who do not know yet, uh, the PGS Lecture Series is a monthly gathering where we feature a specific geographical undertaking in the Philippines um, or those that are done by Filipino um, uh, with regards to geographic research. The PGS LS is co-sponsored by the UP Department of Geography. Like you, I am excited to hear this afternoon's lectures, uh, lecture not only because the speaker is a former, former student of mine, of mine, but more importantly because we get to see how it is to be a humanitarian geographer. Um, to our current BS geography students, I think you would want to listen to this as this is another career path you may want to explore once you finish the program. On this note, I am also happy to share the word cloud that we have generated from the participants' registration. Keywords include passion, life-saving, fulfilling, help, charity, voluntarism, love, inspiring, sympathy, progressive, and empowerment. This is quite an inspiring mix of words and I am intrigued as to how these words can tie up to this afternoon's lecture. Muli, maraming salamat for joining us on behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Geography. Welcome to our 10th PGS lecture series for 2022. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Eman Garcia. So at this point, allow me to introduce our invited speaker for this lecture. Currently assigned as the Assistant Director for Monitoring and Analysis of the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management, which is also known as the AHA Center, our guest speaker started to engage in humanitarian work at the onset of his professional career when he entered into public service in May 2013. He joined the AHA Center six years after that, uh, in January in 2019. But I'll leave it to him to tell you more about the rest of his remarkable journey in this very challenging field of practice. To talk about maps and humanitarian work, I'm honored to pass the mic to our guest for today's lecture, Mr. Lawrence Anthony Di Maibig. So, LA, hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you again, Mamoni and Sir Eman and everyone else. <laughs> okay, uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. And can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yes. All Thank right. You. All right. So I think uh, I'll I'll uh, go straight uh, to my presentation. So I titled it uh, "Making Maps and Saving Lives." This is a uh, more of a uh, uh, more than a lecture series. This is more of a sharing uh, session, uh, uh, giving you an idea of uh, what it is like as a humanitarian geographer how I am, as a geographer, how I am able to use the knowledge that I've learned 
uh, when I was still, you know, uh, uh, when I was doing the, when I finished <laughs> the BS Geography program into my current career uh, in the humanitarian field. So uh, before I go uh, uh, to, to the sharing portion, I just want you to provide, I just want to provide first a historical background of uh, the disaster management mechanism in ASEAN. So I think this is uh, the lecture portion. <laughs> so everything started actually in 2004. So in uh, 2004, there was uh, um, an in, uh, what we call it the Indian Ocean Earthquake and Tsunami. So this was a very catastrophic disaster event that affected uh, the Southeast Asian region, the South Asian region, and even portions of the African continent. So the magnitude of the impact of this catastrophic disaster was a uh, very, very large scale. In the ASEAN region specifically, there were multiple member states that were affected. Those are Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar. Hundreds and thousands of people actually died uh, because of this one and millions uh, were affected and displaced. So this was a, a global scale uh, disaster, so to speak. Before that, there was no ASEAN, or until that time, there was no disaster management mechanism in ASEAN. But a year after that, one of the learnings that the ASEAN region got from this catastrophic event is there is a necessity for the ASEAN region to uh, create a disaster management mechanism such that if one or more ASEAN member states get affected by a disaster, the other ASEAN member states should follow a mechanism to support the affected member state. And there should be a center to do this disaster management coordination. So that was the thought, that was the learning point from the ASEAN leaders. So that's why in 2005, uh, there became the ASEAN, uh, there, 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 uh, it was born, you know, this is called the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response, or what we call ADMR. ADMR is a legally binding agreement. So all ASEAN 10 member states agreed that in, a, in any case of a disaster where one or more member states gets affected, the other member states will come in to help. Uh, one thing that is uh, very beautiful about, uh, uh, about this uh, progress towards the creation of the ADMR is it was very fast. Uh, one year in the ASEAN process is very, very fast. Why? Uh, this is one thing that you will have to learn when you, when you uh, do your political geography class, right? Uh, each country, each member state of the ASEAN region have their own agenda. And the way the ASEAN region works is all the agenda, all the 10 member states must have the same agenda before it becomes a regional agenda. So that means all ASEAN member states must say yes. If at least one of the member states says no, then it's a closed deal, no go. So that is why this is very fast because usually the discussion, the lobbying, it takes years uh, before something uh, became, you know, became fruitful in terms of the prog of the processing in the ASEAN region. So that's why one year, you know, from a disaster event, and then a, a year after that, actually a few months after that, there's already a legally binding agreement. And legally binding agreement is the highest of all forms of agreement in the ASEAN region. So this is very, very fast. Again, uh, because the agenda is similar, all 10 ASEAN member states agree that, you know, uh, well, they are going to be affected by a disaster sometime in the future. And it is necessary that, you know, we help our neighboring countries when such time arises. So that's why it is a very good uh, example. And then from that one, from that legally binding agreement, now next is, you know, the, the usual long process of, okay, now that we have the agreement that we should cooperate in terms of, in times of emergency response and in enhancing our resilience, our uh, improving our disaster management, the next step is for us to establish the organization that will do this for us. And that is what we are doing at the AHA Center. So as you can see from the 2005 agreement, 
it took a little uh, you know the usual asian time frame until we got born so in 2011 november of 2011 the aha center uh was uh born uh so right now we are uh based in jakarta indonesia and then we have our uh what we call disaster emergency logistics system for asean warehouse uh we have three warehouses for for this disaster emergency logistics system we call it delsa warehouses uh our main delsa warehouse is in malaysia so uh that is co-managed by the united nations and then we have one satellite warehouse in thailand so we have a staff there and then another warehouse in the philippines uh, another staff there as well and then we also have ongoing response operations in myanmar and we have a, a, an office there as well so these are the uh, footprints uh, that we have but of course we serve uh, across the region all the 10 asean member states and moving forward so what do we do at the aha center we have our four core functions number one is a uh, coordination when we talk about coordination this is a uh, uh, talking you know with uh, coordinating collaborating with different stakeholders so we have three levels of coordination. We call it strategic, operational, and then field level. Strategic coordination is when we discuss disaster management uh, matters with the ASEAN leaders, because you know at that level of discussion, it's more strategic. What is our vision? What do we want to achieve? What is our agenda, disaster management agenda? So this is more of the guidance, what we want to do, what we want to achieve. And then the next one is the operational level of coordination. Uh, this is more of how we are going to do what the leaders want us to do. So this is uh, more of us talking in the Philippines. We talk a lot with NDRRMC, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. And imagine the NDRRMC of all the 10 ASEAN member states. They are, are our operational partners. So you know we, we, we talk with them a lot. They're actually our boss. We report to them. And then we have the field level coordination. Field level coordination is uh, what happens in ground zero. So for example, in the case of Typhoon Haiyan, for example, when the AHA Center sent our staff in Tacloban, then the staff in Tacloban uh, conducts this coordination with the government, with the uh, provincial government of, uh, of uh, Visayas, of, of, of uh, Leyte, and then uh, you know, conducts all of the support uh, that they could extend. So those are the three levels of coordination. And then we have disaster information management. Disaster information management is uh, my bread and butter. And this, this is of, of the four core functions, this is our task. Uh, our team actually does all the four, <laughs> but the number two, the disaster information management, our team is the lead uh, for this one. So I'll talk more later on, on what we are doing in terms of disaster information management. Resource management, these are the relief resources that we uh, support uh, the member states with. And this includes the relief items. This includes the human resources as well uh, in case uh, we need to send some experts to support the country that is affected by a disaster. And then lastly, knowledge and outreach. I'll be talking a bit on this as well uh, because this might be something that might be interesting to the students and even uh, to uh, the Department of Geography. Uh, you might you know, want to hear uh, what we have uh, for you, actually, <laughs> that you could uh, be part of in terms of our knowledge and outreach activities. Now, uh, going forward to my team. Okay, so this is my team. Uh, we are covering 10 countries, more than 600 million people, and these are the people who monitors uh, the Southeast Asian region on a 24-7 basis. So we don't have weekends, we don't have uh, holidays uh, because uh, disasters can happen anytime. But of course, uh, we still are able to maintain our work-life balance with the use of technology. So technology is helping us do our uh, work, uh, even though you know uh, that, that means we, we, we still can sleep, <laughs> we still can take our leave, and uh, uh, we're still able to do uh, the roles that we should be doing, even though we are not in the office 24 seven, or even though, you know, we are not, uh, even though we are sleeping uh, through technology, we're able to do that. So we are five people at the moment, and we call ourselves as the gatekeepers of One ASEAN One Response. One ASEAN One Response is the spirit of, uh, this is the principle that we follow in terms of uh, responding uh, the ASEAN way. 
And we are called the gatekeepers because any response in ASEAN will start from these five people. Because these five people are the ones who assess the levels of risk. These five people are the ones who recommends the necessary course of action that the ASEAN region must take. And two of these people are actually from the Department of Geography. So our alumni, so uh, myself, and then we also have Mr. Keith Landicho, uh, uh, Disaster Monitoring and Analysis Officer of the AHA Center. Uh, he's been with us since 2020. So he joined us during the pandemic, actually. So he's uh, uh, more than two years now with the AHA Center. Uh, we also have uh, the, the three gentlemen with us are Indonesians, uh, Sadhu, Fadli, and Faisal. And all of these five, actually, what we have in common, we have geography in common. <laughs> so uh, myself, Kit, and Sadhu, we are geographers. Uh, Sadhu is an Indonesian geographer from University of Indonesia. Myself and Keith uh, uh, from UP, of course. Uh, Fadli and Faisal from the same in university in Indonesia as well. Uh, uh, we, their course is also related uh, to geography. So this is the uh, Center's Disaster Monitoring and Analysis Unit. And now, I uh, just want to give you an example of uh, what we're doing. You know, what is it like uh, as a what what is it like as a humanitarian geographer? So the one that you're seeing on top is what we call the ASEAN DMRS or the Disaster Monitoring and Response System. Definitely, it is, is, it is a map. Uh, it is provide, providing us with locational information. And there are many icons that you are seeing there. <laughs> Those icons are actually the disasters, hazards and disasters that are happening. Uh, this, this is as of last week. So last week was uh, quite heavy, lots of things. Even this week, actually, we're monitoring several uh, weather systems in the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, and then there's one uh, that might impact Myanmar. In addition to right now in the Philippines, I think it's already the start of the Northeast monsoon, which means that you know south of the equator, if 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 in the if uh it's it's dry air uh in the north of equator, south of the equator is where you know it dumps the all of the water. So it's a rainy season right now in Indonesia. Every day it's raining actually. And uh, <clears throat> everything that we do uh, in terms of monitoring, we do it using the ASEAN DMRS. So this is our primary disaster and hazards monitoring tool. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a technology that helps us do the monitoring. How? Because this is a smart system. Uh, what it does is it monitors itself. Uh, the system is connected with different data sources. Uh, providing us the information, data and information pertaining to hazards and disasters. Once it detects a hazard or a disaster, it notifies us. So it will tell us that this hazard and disaster, based on our threshold, this is, uh, let's say, an information threshold only, information level. That means, okay, information, we just have to know that a, an earthquake happened or a flooding happened in, in some area in Southeast Asia. That's for information. But if the alert that we receive from DMRS is at a warning level, then that means this is something serious. Then we need to uh, conduct uh, more analysis on the risk of this particular hazard or disaster. So the DMRS is doing the filtering for us. We put there already uh, different thresholds. And then each threshold we call either it's information, advisory, uh, alert, or warning level. So warning level is the highest one. Once it is warning level, we just go to our guidelines, and then there's already a specific uh, uh, steps that we have to do, uh, it depending on uh, the alert level. And uh, that is uh, what we usually do on a 24-7 basis. So even though uh, when we sleep at night, uh, if we, you know, like our phones have to be always accessible, uh, I have a, I, I set a specific ringtone for for um for the ASEAN DMRS. So if I hear that sound, then I have to wake up, check if, okay, this one is a warning level, then that means uh, we have <laughs> to uh, wake up, uh, do a little bit more analysis, and then inform the ASEAN region that, hey, something is happening in the ASEAN region, uh, and it is important for you to know because this particular incident uh, may, you know, may, may uh, actually have the possibility to require a regional level of response. So the photo uh, uh, below is uh, what our EOC looks like. Uh, it's uh, it's it's bigger than this. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, I was looking for a good photo to show the whole EOC. 
uh, but I didn't see uh, a, a good photo with me in there <laughs> because uh, in uh, we rotate so uh, within the DMA team we rotate who's going to do the uh, the briefing. Uh, right now I do less of the briefing because uh, now we have the officers to do it. Uh, just I just right now I just uh, give more of guidance, train them how to do it. But uh, I more that's why most of the photos are with Keith or or with Sado or with the other team members. But yeah, this are uh, what our uh, uh, EOC looks like. So there's a huge screen in front, and then the people are sitting. Uh, uh, there are three rows actually. You are just seeing the first row. So are there are two rows uh, behind them, and in this particular office is uh, where we actually conduct the briefing. So when there is uh, the last briefing that we did was with Typhoon Noru, uh, the 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 recent uh, super typhoon in the Philippines, and then we conducted the briefing in our EOC. And this is where we invite the Secretary General of the ASEAN, the ambassadors of the ASEAN member states. Uh, this is also where uh, when when the presidents, vice presidents, or ministers of the ASEAN member states uh, go to visit us. Uh, we give them a tour uh, in this uh, facility. So moving forward, uh, just wanted to give you an, a, uh, another story of how I am able to use the uh, uh, things that I learned in BS Geography in my current career. So going back here, oh, oh here. Yeah, I, I, I missed this slide. So this one, uh, let me move my okay. So back in 2019, there was a series of weather systems that affected the ASEAN region. Uh, it affected uh, minor impact to Philippines, minor impact in Thailand, moderate in, in Cambodia and Vietnam, but it had a major impact in Lao PDR. So the two tropical cyclones, it's uh, one after the other. So, you know, uh, the areas are already flooded and then there comes another tropical storm. In terms of uh, the level of this tropical storm, uh, this is, you know, tropical storm and tropical depression level only. Uh, so uh, in Philippines, this is like, uh, uh, like you know, usual, nothing. Uh, but for, for Lao, this is already uh, quite, this can already uh, give, uh, result to, a quite, to quite serious effects. So you can see there already that uh, there are differences in terms of uh, the advancements of the ASEAN member states in terms of how they manage disasters. A very strong typhoon may be you know, something that will require the Philippines. A, a, a super typhoon uh, would be something that may require the Philippines to seek international assistance. Uh, but you know, for some member states, even tropical depression level only, uh, they may already require a regional level of assistance. And this is uh, one of those cases. Uh, during this time, uh, when we monitor the tropical uh, uh, cyclones, uh, we already saw that uh, there were you know, uh, not much impact actually in terms of uh, the number of people affected in the usual member states that is being affected by typhoon like Philippines and Vietnam. But what happened with uh, Lao PDR is uh, they requested for assistance because uh, they were receiving uh, reports of massive flooding in the in their southern provinces. So when we uh, supported Lao PDR at the time, the first thing that our team did is we requested Sentinel Asia for satellite imagery. So the photo that you are seeing on the left is actually the the this is already the result of the satellite imagery. So from the satellite imagery, what we did is uh, together with our partners from Earth Observatory of Singapore, uh, satellite imagery, of course, you have to know <laughs> how to identify the permanent bodies of water like rivers and lakes versus the you know, non-permanent bodies of water, which in this case, uh, that's what we use as uh, the, uh, that's how we identified it as flooding. Because you know, uh, there shouldn't be water there. <laughs> But based on the satellite imagery uh, capture, there, are, there is water there, right? So now we were able to see the flooded areas uh, after conducting this spatial analysis. So yeah, you, you have to, uh, uh, students, you have to uh, uh, focus uh, on your uh, uh, GIS classes if you uh, wanted <laughs> to have a career on humanitarian, uh, as a humanitarian geographer. So after we were able to identify the areas that are flooded, 
So as you can see, there are uh, areas in uh, Kamuan, in Savanaket, and Champasak, and Atapu. So these three areas, uh, the red one is, this one is in Savanaket, this is that area, if we zoom in. This one in Champasak is this area. And then this one in Atapu in this area. As you can see here, the one in Champasak is you know, very near the river. So most likely this is the river overflowing. And this one in Atapu uh, also you know, uh, near the river. Uh, for the one in Savanaket, I cannot see river. But anyway, these are the flooded areas. So what we did when uh, Laupedia requested for assistance at the time is they wanted us to help them conduct assessment of the affected areas. Because the results of the assessment will be their basis for the mobilization of the resources. Like, you know, how many sacks of rice they need to uh, give to the communities, actually identifying the communities that has been affected, how many in the communities will need assistance, what types of assistance will be needed, so on and so forth. So this is what they want to do. Uh, they need to conduct an assessment. So what we did after we, we were able to gather the uh, uh, flooded uh, areas, we look at the reports of the government. We look at the areas where there are already reported a number or you know, report, reported impact. So when we overlay these two uh, affected areas, areas with reported impact, what you will see there is actually the affected areas that have no reported impacts. So meaning, you know, based on satellite imagery, these areas are, affect, are, are affected. They are flooded. However, they are not sending reports to the government. So there must be a problem. So that is why our recommendation back then is this should be the priority areas for the conduct of the assessment. Because these areas flooded, but they're not receiving uh, impact information. While the other areas flooded, but <clears throat> they're already providing impact information. So this is a uh, prioritization is necessary because when you conduct uh, assessment in humanitarian uh, operations, Time is of essence. You have to do the assessment as quick as possible. But even though you know time is, is uh, uh, limited and also the resources, the number of people that you can mobilize, you know, you cannot conduct like a, like a full census where everybody you will do assessment. That's why in terms of the sampling of which areas you need to assess, you really need to conduct some prioritization, some sampling methods, uh, quantitative analysis. So guys, you should listen to that one. So you'll know how to do uh, sampling methods. Also, if you have stat or math, uh, math subjects, you have to focus on those as well if you wanted to, to have a career on humanitarian geography. Okay, so now that we were able to provide the uh, recommendation of the areas to be assessed, then the next step that we did is the actual assessment. So I went to Lao PDR to help them develop the tool, uh, you know, uh, the questions that they need to ask, the methodology that they need to do. Okay, again, stat. Uh, you need this <laughs> when you because uh, assessment is like doing survey, right? So we follow statistical uh, methodologies in doing so. Uh, but in the humanitarian uh, sense, uh, these are uh, you have to apply these concepts. Meaning, not everything that that not everything that that we will learn uh, in the program. Uh, in 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 actuality, you ju we just pick what uh, is uh, appropriate to be applied. So there are always, uh, it's not necessary that, you know, that the full thing that you learn, you will apply eventually because some of it actually uh, may not be appropriate uh, when you do the, the application eventually. Okay, so going back to my story. So this is uh, when I went to uh, Vientiane. Uh, these are all in the southern provinces of Vientiane. And uh, the one on the upper left is uh, a meeting that we're doing with the governor. The one on the upper right is the assessment. Uh, this one is assessment with the government, with the governor. The one on the right, assessment with the community that got affected. Uh, so also uh, cultural geography, you have to be uh, able to understand the different culture as well. As you can see here, uh, this is how we do the meeting in Lao PDR. So sitting on the floor. And then uh, this is actually the, the uh, like the vice minister, like, you know, uh, undersecretary of uh, the uh, uh, social welfare ministry, uh, the one beside me. So he's the leader of the uh, assessment team. And then I was just there to provide the technical assistance. The one in here, the bottom left, is uh, when I was uh, 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 teaching them how to use the tools that we co-develop. Uh, also, uh, it is very, the, 
concept of <clears throat> co-development is very important in humanitarian work. So even though we have the technical know-how, we have to contextualize it into you know how they are uh, doing it uh, uh, before we come, right? Before we arrive. So basic meaning they already have their own process, the technical know-how of doing the assessment, all of these things. We uh, have to redesign it so that it fits what they already know. Otherwise, you know, if you introduce a totally different thing to a group of people, there will be lots of resistance. And in the end, you will not be able to do the outcome uh, that, that you wanted to do. So at this uh, a time we were discussing, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm providing the technical assistance on uh, what, how, you know, how to do the prioritization, how to develop the tool, how to conduct the assessment, but I have to follow their context, how they are doing it uh, the low PDR way. So this is us, you know, uh, co-developing uh, the methodology. And then the one on the right is uh, uh, a photo of one of the affected schools. It is not uh, very much seen here, but the level of flooding is actually visible in this photo. Uh, I hope you could see my 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 uh, cursor. So above this door, you can see there's a different color of the wall. This one is a bit brown versus the one above, which is the usual cream color of the rooms. So as you can see, the level of uh, flood is above the door. It's above, you know, it's higher than a person. So that's how deep uh, the uh, the flooding uh, in this particular school at the time. And then uh, when I look at the map, this particular school is about 500 meters away from the uh, river, from the nearest river. So the extent of flooding in this area is quite significant because even though it's 500 meters away already, the, the depth of the flooding is you know more than two meters, almost three meters. So it is a uh, very high. And then these are the books that got damaged uh, because of the flood. Uh, and together with me, uh, the lady in blue is uh, from World Food Program. Uh, the guy in green is uh, the, a teacher uh, in the school. And then the guy in front of me is from the Ministry of Social Welfare. So uh, this is us uh, doing the assessment. This is uh, regarding the impact to education. Now, uh, another very important thing that uh, we do as, a, as humanitarian geographers is really putting the value on the information. Uh, what is very important is the result of the assessment that we conducted, the one that you are seeing on the left. So after the assessment, we were able to uh, get the national screenshot. Uh, there are more than 765,000 people affected because of this flooding in the six provinces uh, in Southern Lao PDR. So, Kamuan, Savanaket, Saravan, Sekong, Atape, Champasak, the, the most affected in terms of the number of people is Champasak, uh, followed by Saravan. And uh, this is uh, on the impact. Uh, in addition to the number of people affected, also we were able to gather information on the houses damage, <clears throat> infrastructures damage, how many casualties, impact to uh, the agriculture, because in these six provinces, agriculture is the main source of income. Uh, economic geography. <laughs> so also you have to listen to that one. And then in addition to understanding the impact, we also have to know what do they need. So we were able to uh, calculate how many you know, tons of rice the government of uh, Lao PDR needs to prepare uh, to provide support to all of the affected communities, uh, including the kitchen sets, because you know they it got washed away by uh, their their the belongings of the communities got washed away uh, by the flooding. Hygiene kits as well, family kits, and uh, food. Uh, this is uh, more on food, but uh, in addition, uh, this is just a snapshot. There are more detailed uh, information coming out of the assessment. And the important thing is this information translated eventually to aid. So this is what the government of Lao PD are used as their basis for mobilizing the resources. You know, uh, what resources they need to prepare, how many resources, and then where they should be pushing these resources to help the affected communities, how many per community, so on and so forth. So as you can see here, it started with this, <laughs> a satellite imagery that uh, we analyzed, eventually translated into food uh, to help some, uh, uh, you know, a family in Lao PDR that is in dire need of something to eat. 
So that is uh, basically, you know, the, the uh, shortened <laughs> workflow of uh, what we are doing specifically for this uh, particular operations. Uh, so the one on the right that you are seeing, these are the relief resources that is uh, being mobilized by ASEAN uh, to be sent out to uh, Lao PDR to augment, you know, because uh, we've already identified the needs of the, of the people of Lao PDR. So the next step is for the ASEAN to chip in you know, the countries chip in uh, what we could help to support uh, Lao PDR. So that's uh, what we do in a nutshell. And in addition to that one, uh, that's about, you know, 50% of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, doing all the monitoring, analysis, so on and so forth. And in addition, oh, this one, <laughs> sorry. So all of those operations basically is like uh, what we've been doing for the past 37 responses that we did since our establishment in 2011. So our first operation started in 2012. Uh, this is Myanmar earthquake. As you can see in this map, you know, a lot of icons are in the Philippines. Philippines is a, a, a very disaster prone country. And uh, we did a lot of uh, responses to the Philippines. I think the last one is uh, last December, Typhoon Odette, uh, international names Typhoon Rai. Uh, previous year, Typhoon Goni. With Noru, we actually... We, uh, with Typhoon Noru, with the super typhoon, we actually uh, offered assistance to Philippines, but the capacity of Philippines at the time uh, is still sufficient uh, to respond. So uh, they uh, said no to our uh, offer of assistance. And uh, But uh, Noru actually impacted not just Philippines, it impacted Vietnam. We offered assistance to Vietnam. Vietnam said they also still have sufficient uh, uh, capacity. It also impacted Thailand. Thailand, uh, we supported Thailand. We sent uh, relief items to Thailand. And then Lao PDR, we also offered. So for Lao PDR, we are in the process of uh, discussing uh, what kind of need uh, they, they want uh, in terms of response to Noru. So uh, all of these responses basically start with those geographers that we have in the team. And in addition to that one, there are also many other uh, things that we do uh, as humanitarian geographers. One is shaping the ASEAN disaster management agenda. The two documents that you are seeing here, the one on the left is called the ADMR work program. Again, ADMR is the agreement, ASEAN agreement on disaster management and emergency response. So that agreement, uh, we have to translate it into a work program, a list of outputs that we could achieve every five years. So we have every five year, we cycle through it. That means that every five years, we have to develop the work program. The current work program that we have is for 2021 to 2025. Uh, my, I joined the AHA Center in 2019. Kate joined the AHA Center in 2020. That means that in the development of this work program, we have our inputs. So in terms of uh, shaping what the ASEAN region will be doing as part of its disaster management agenda in, the, you know, in, the, in this current five-year cycle, we were able to provide our uh, contributions in terms of ideas and how we could move forward uh, to improve our disaster management as a region. The one on the right is the AHA Center work plan. This is uh, our five-year work plan. So the work program is a set of outputs, outcomes. This is what we want to achieve. The work plan, which is for the AHA Center, is our how-to, this is our manual. So this one, this is like a wish list. This is what the ASEAN region wants to do during these five years. This document, the one on the right, is the how the uh, center will be doing these things during these five years. So also in the development of the how, you know, not just of the what we want to achieve, but also the how we could achieve this in terms of developing this uh, inputs, uh, Keith and myself as well provided some contributions. So again, that means that actually there's also opportunity for humanitarian geographers to contribute you know, to shaping not just how we are doing disaster management in the Philippines, but at the international platform as well. In this case, uh, in the ASEAN region. Another uh, thing, uh, another activity that we are doing as humanitarian geographers here in the ASEAN region is we conduct uh, assessments of the ASEAN disaster risk tape. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, on an annual basis, we conduct a, an assessment of the different uh, disaster risk of the ASEAN member states. And uh, the results of these assessments we publish into our, our annual publication. We call this ARMOR. The annual publication is ARMOR or ASEAN Risk Monitor and Disaster Management Review. Uh, 
uh, we had we started in 2019 and at 2022 this year uh, we just uh, launched uh, our third edition. So in the first edition, uh, I co-authored uh, the first uh, review, and this became the official statistics of ASEAN in terms of disaster risk scale. So this is more updated than the UN uh, estimates, and uh, because the UN estimates are using global level models, what we are using are a combination of the global uh, level models, regional level models, and national level models. So this is a composite model uh, looking at all of these three. Uh, there's a difference if you use the global level models because that means, uh, for example, the hazard maps that you are using is at the global level. So, you know, one pixel there might be like three provinces already uh, in the Philippines. So that means, you know, in the Philippines, three provinces is generalized into one value only, right? Uh, if you use a national level, of course, it's uh, uh, more uh, precise, right? But uh, with the global level, of course, there are some advantages to it. So we conduct a compos composite of the different models to come up with the methodology that we are using for the risk scale. So 2019, I co-authored uh, the first one. And then uh, the first risk assessment, we look at the connection between the hazard, the disaster risk scape of the ASEAN region versus our economic progress. So what we saw is that uh, at this time, it was, uh, I think, three times, meaning uh, the cost of disaster uh, in the ASEAN region, you know, the if if uh, the, the the if the worst case scenario happens, that you know the maximum disaster risk in the ASEAN region is triggered, the resulting cost is three times higher than the combined economy of the ASEAN region. So that means you know one catastrophic disaster of that scale uh, could send us like years back in terms of our regional development. And then on the second edition, that was in 2020, I uh, co-authored this uh, with Keith, another geographer from, from our department as well. And our focus uh, during the uh, 2020 edition is we look at how climate change is uh, impacting uh, the disaster risk in the ASEAN region. And then recently, I co-authored this as well with, with Keith and, and uh, some other authors, and we look at what was the impact of COVID-19 to the disaster risk scape of the ASEAN region? And in conducting the assessment, of course, there are many uh, uh, different uh, knowledge that, you know, that we use in order to, to arrive to this. Uh, and uh, those knowledge actually are you know, a combination of, of almost all of the classes that <laughs> we had in the BS Geography program. So uh, guys, uh, uh, don't have your favorite. It's okay to have your favorite subject, but please focus on all of them so that you know they will be uh, useful uh, eventually if you wanted to have a career as a humanitarian geographer. Oh, uh, I forgot to also mention here that in the Armour First Edition, I also co-authored an article looking at the uh, cities that are most at risk to uh, disasters in the ASEAN region. So in the first edition, I think I, I, I submitted two articles. So uh, uh, again, also there's a particular focus on urban uh, uh, cities because you know they have higher exposures uh, to disasters, and uh, this is uh, of course uh, where you will be able to use the different theories as well that we learn in the BS Geography program. And this is something the armor is also something that might be interesting for our students and for our uh, 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 department because uh, this you can actually contribute an article here. So for the fourth edition, we will be uh, sending out the call for abstract as soon, and I will share it with the Department of Geography. Uh, the students may actually contribute. So even though you're still a student, you could already publish. Uh, and this is uh, an ASEAN level publication. Yeah? This is a scientific publication, by the way. Uh, so you could already you know, be a published uh, 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 author. Uh, even though you're still a student. And of course, uh, to our uh, uh, professors at uh, the Department of Geography. And uh, <clears throat> what else on the armor? I think that's it for armor. And then uh, be mindful of the time. So I'll be finishing quickly. Uh, we are also managing the ASEAN disaster database. Uh, maybe this might be something interesting for the students. If you wanted to do a research regarding disasters in ASEAN, uh, if you want to download the data, we have the data downloadable. Uh, through adinet.ahacenter.org. So you could uh, just register there and then you could download uh, the data in there. 
uh, you could see all the disasters in the ASEAN region since 2012. Uh, we started collecting in 2012. And it's uh, updated every day. So you, you'll see uh, this is the freshest data that you could have in terms of uh, disasters in the ASEAN region. And these are the official data uh, that we have for the region. And then we also look at, uh, of course, uh, we work with, the, as a coordinating center, we work with different organizations. Uh, we work with different emergency operation centers. Uh, ASEAN region, the concept one ASEAN one response, basically uh, we are only as strong as our weakest member, right? Uh, if one member state is uh, uh, left behind, then that member state you know, will require more and more and more assistance. That is why in terms of capacity building, strengthening, we have to involve everyone and we really have to look uh, more on those that uh, require more attention. So we have what we call the AIMNET, ASEAN Information Management Network, which aims to strengthen uh, the capacities of the emergency operation centers of all emergency operation centers of the 10 ASEAN member states, including the AHA Center. So uh, as you can see, uh, I, the, the, one, the photo on the right is, uh, oh, this is the photo of our EOC. This is a better photo uh, than the one I showed earlier. Yeah, it's the one on the right. The one on the left, this is the focal persons from all the 10 ASEAN member states. I am the one wearing red in here beside me ski. So these are the two from UP Department of Geography. Yay. <laughs> All right. And oh, this one as well might be something interesting, especially for the Department of Geography. So we have a new initiative and uh, this one is actually being led by Keith. Uh, this one is what we call the ADILAB or the ASEAN Disaster Information Laboratory. As you can see, this is, inform this is a laboratory. So what we want to, to do here is to generate knowledge. So we will be opening up you know, all the data. We will be providing discussions pertaining to disaster management in the region. The idea here is uh, we innovate how we uh, deal with disaster management in the ASEAN region. This is where we will develop tools. We will develop concepts. We will develop SOPs, anything that uh, could improve, innovate the way we do disaster management in the ASEAN region. So that is why this is our laboratory. This is where we experiment, we discuss, experiment, test, and eventually if it is you know, really effective, then we ro roll it out to the ASEAN region. So this is where we really generate uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, we will be uh, uh, releasing this one very soon. Uh, we will be you know, calling for members, uh, volunteers. In terms of membership, I think right now we're looking at uh, organizations rather than individuals. So maybe the UP Department of Geography, uh, representing both the teaching staff and the students, uh, might be interested in partnering with us uh, together uh, in this initiative. And lastly, I think uh, this is uh, my last slide. Uh, I think uh, this is where everything started. So from, from where I am right now, everything actually started at this particular seat. <laughs> Uh, this was uh, the photo when I was deployed in 2013 uh, in Tacloban. Uh, so this is uh, Typhoon Yolanda, Typhoon Haiyan. Uh, when I graduated in 2013, a uh, few months after, I got offered with a position at the Department of Social Welfare and Development, DSWD. My, uh, the, offer, the offered position to me uh, back then was uh, the GIS administrator of the department. So I have to manage all the GIS assets of the, of the DSWD. And then, uh, of course, there's a lot of GIS asset pertaining to disaster management because uh, there's, you know, there's always a request for mapping of evacuation centers, uh, uh, conducting spatial analysis on which route to take so that it will be faster and more efficient uh, from the warehouse and then delivering the relief items to the uh, evacuation centers, for example, so on and so forth. So uh, these are the, you know, some of the things that I did. And then uh, when I was deployed in 2013 uh, in, in Haiyan, it was, it was a very difficult experience because of the levels of devastation. It was uh, difficult for, for me physically, mentally, emotionally at the time. As you can see here, the one where I'm sitting is the one where I'm working. And <laughs> that's also the same place where I sleep. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, when, when we were deployed there, we're basically like affected persons as well. You know, we don't have access to any sleeping quarters because there are no sleeping quarters. <laughs> the affected persons are either in 
you know, sleeping outside the damaged houses or somewhere. You just find where you can sleep, basically. So that's us as well. So yeah, in that same seat, uh, I almost got married with that seat. I've spent a lot of my days uh, back then uh, sitting in that chair. And that's where I work, sleep, eat, everything I do, I do it there. So physically, it is very exhausting, mentally as well. The people that you are seeing there uh, are people who wanted to communicate with the people outside. So when we arrived there, we have a different mission. Our My mission back there is to, uh, uh, to basically uh, make a map of the evacuation centers. But at the time, we just cannot do it. You cannot travel around Tacloban, you know, it's like, uh, this is uh, the first few days, yeah. So I was part of the of the first team uh, from the national uh, government to arrive. Uh, this is right after the impact of Yolanda. So at the time, we brought our equipment, emergency telecommunications equipment. And then because, you know, I cannot do the mapping at the time, uh, what we just did is at the time, Tacloban was still not contactable. Uh, so what we did is we opened up to the public. Since we have we are able to connect to outside Tacloban using our satellite, using our emergency telecoms, we provided you know free internet service. So the laptops that you are seeing are our laptops. And what we are doing there actually finding their family in Facebook, email, wherever, finding their family in the internet, just so these people that you are seeing can communicate to their relatives that they are still alive. There was this uh, one story that I would like to share, which uh, really broke my heart. So there was this uh, very elder, elderly lady who approached us. At that time, uh, there's, uh, I was also working with another alum, uh, alumna of the UP Department of Geography, uh, Sandra Tabinas. Uh, I recruited her to join in the SWD. And then at the time, uh, an elderly lady uh, uh, approached her asking if she could help the Lola find her daughter. I uh, was uh, in Manila at the time. So we were able to find the daughter in, in Facebook and then chat in Messenger. And then the Lola cannot, uh, you know, uh, cannot use the laptop, don't know how to use all of this. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're being the, ha the hands and eyes uh, uh, for her to, to do the communication. So what she said was very devastating. She said, uh, can you tell this to my daughter? Uh, wala na silang lahat. Ako na lang ang nandito. So, you know, we were, we were, we were very devastated, you know, like, like we've been uh, sleepless for, for, for many days. And then you will hear these stories, you know, it's, it's really heartbreaking. And these are just one of the heartbreaking stories that, that I experienced. The, the most heartbreaking story that I experienced when I was deployed in Tacloban is uh, after my one week tour of duty here doing all of this, I have to go back to Manila for, for resting and to, you know, to re-energize myself. So on the way back to the airport, I, I was on board the military uh, truck. At the time, there's still a lot of debris, uh, combination of items and dead people on the road. Still, it's already one week, yeah? And uh, while we were passing through the street, going to the airport, uh, I see a lot of debris, again, uh, trash uh, along, along the road. And then many dead bodies as well. Many are, you know, uh, some are in body bags, some are covered with what with anything that could cover them. And then there was this one newspaper on the pile of debris, and then it got you know blown away by the wind, exposing a toddler. It was a you know is already black, is 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 a dead kid. And then at the time when well, well, you know when 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 I saw the kid, it really broke my heart even more. And then I was already you know tears are are falling from my eyes. And it was at that time that I told to myself that I will do everything in my capacity so that this will not happen again. And that is why I became passionate about humanitarian work. So that was still in 2013, that drive in me, that passion in my heart is still alive and burning up to this day. So that is uh, what drives me. That is uh, the reason why I am, you know, uh, surviving <laughs> as a humanitarian geographer. And I hope that you guys, I'm, I'm actually very happy when I saw the work out earlier. I hope that you guys also find your passion soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, LDA, for your um, enlightening 
no, uh, presentation and for all the insights that you shared. At this point, uh, the floor is now open for our audience to ask their questions. We encourage everyone to type their questions either in Slido. Um, um, PJ already provided the link, um, the site uh, where you can that you can visit and where you can put your questions, or you can simply just uh, type in or encode your questions here at the Zoom chat box. So please, um, anyone from the audience, if anyone would also like to use their microphone and speak um, to ask their questions or perhaps, you know, share your comments, share your insights as well, um, we're encouraging you to do so. So I guess if, if I may be allowed, <laughs> as moderator to ask the first question. So LA, um, yon, kanina, I've been taking down notes and I actually have uh, more than one question for you, some more comments, um, but really it was a very motivating um, uh, presentation. My concern at the beginning was because of the um, because of, of, of the new, yun, parang the bulk of information that you can generate, um, and that of course is one function of the center, I would think that um, different, you know, at different levels of governance, at dif um, talking about uh, different countries in the in the region, you would, you know, uh, get perhaps different kinds of responses, or they would say, okay, we're we're, we're considering your recommendations, um, but we have we want to do it this way. Would there be um, instances when you know when when there is an emergency or crisis situation, when the responses of concerned states because because this particular event was uh, enormous that it affects uh, more than one country, would there be conflicting perhaps responses? And in 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 the event that there is this kind of, of, of uh, parang response to the information that you are giving them, how would you respond or react to that? Um, my thinking is that the, the center would come up with recommendations as well, aside from, from the information. So I think, um, I'm, I, of course, I'm thinking of certain kinds of uh, disaster events already, but I don't want to be specific. Um, I'm thinking that perhaps this question is relevant whenever, I mean, specifically relevant for human-induced disasters or crises. So there might be these instances that have happened before, um, and I'm not sure if this is the venue to talk about it because this is a public event, so maybe some, some, some information might it's not necessarily needs to be shared. But yeah, my question is, um, would there be instances like that when you have conflicting responses? And as a center, what do you do in response to that? Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mom Ani, for this question. So uh, just to, get, to provide a little bit more background as well on, on how we uh, support uh, the affected member states and, and on what cases uh, can we do the support. So in terms of the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response, it is already very clear uh, in that agreement that uh, we could definitely support the ASEAN member states if the disaster is caused by a natural hazard. If it is uh, a crisis, a human induced hazard, for example, uh, it is uh, going to be a case by case basis. Uh, so, uh, like, like what happened, for example, in two thousand thirteen, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, two thousand, no, 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 two thousand fifteen and sixteen, a uh, Marawi siege. Uh, that one is, you know, not caused by a natural hazard. Uh, but uh, when the Philippines requested for some assistance, uh, we still provided. But before we were able to provide, we have to discuss with all the 10 ASEAN member states. They have to say yes. If, you know, if they don't give us the blessing, then we cannot. And uh, same is true as well for what's happening right now in Myanmar. So again, for natural hazards, it's straightforward. Uh, we do not need the uh, we do not need to get approval from the member states. Uh, we could already uh, uh, employ our SOP for our uh, assistance. If it's a uh, non-natural uh, hazard, uh, human induced, then we have we need approval first before we employ our SOP. That's the first step. Next, regarding the SOP, uh, there are only two ways 
uh, two options uh, where we could provide the assistance. Number one, if the affected member state asked or requested for assistance, meaning they're willingly opening, opening their door. That's one. Second, uh, we can offer the assistance, but they have to accept. Meaning, you know, we could knock on the door, but they have to open the door first. Now, we cannot just uh, barge in. Hey, this is what you need. <laughs> so that is uh, what's different uh, between the ASEAN disaster management mechanism compared with the international disaster management mechanism. Uh, with the, we know many internationals just, hey, this is, uh, we're here. We know what to do. This is what you need. For us, it's more of, you know, the ASEAN way. You know, it's like uh, in our neighborhood, right? Uh, when we go to our friend's house, we knock first or you know, inform them that we're coming and that we're bringing something or anything else that they need. So that, that's uh, how we, uh, in, a, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, uh, how we do it. Now, when we offer assistance and then they accept it, and then of course we compare information and then what if there are some differences, uh, what we do is uh, we discuss this uh, together with the affected member states. So uh, all of this has to be done uh, diplomatically but quickly. So so far in my experience, uh, for natural, for for you know disasters caused by natural hazards, there's uh, not much uh, you know back and forth in terms of discussing uh, different points of view. Usually, it's very quick. If there's a different point of view, we are, we're for for disasters caused by natural hazards, it's very quick to integrate them. But uh, for some cases, for, for uh, the human-induced ones, uh, especially if the affected member state is a party to the crisis, then, uh, of course, there will be opposing views. And in this case, these are when uh, what we usually do is uh, do it little by little. We, find, uh, we, we have opposing views, maybe on the core or, or on the big sides, but there are still some areas there that we share the same. For areas that we share the same view, we already provide the assistance. You know, we already go because assistance is, is needed as soon as possible. But in, in some issues where uh, we cannot compromise, they cannot compromise, yeah, the, those are the ones that will really uh, take some time. And uh, that's uh, you know usually the case for human induced. I hope I responded to your question, Nama Mon. Um, yes, very well, LA. Uh, would there be other questions? Thank you so much for your answer. So again, uh, you can just input your questions here in our chat box. You can go to Slido if you prefer to. You can also participate in the discussion by, you know, turning on your microphone. Um, we want to see your hands raised first, so we can acknowledge you and then you can speak directly. Okay, so we're getting one. So um, let me just read a few comments from the chat box. So um, Kathy said, thanks for sharing your story, LA. Um, and then uh, TJ uh, also shared Again, the uh, slido.com uh, site you know, for everyone to, you know, um, have your questions out there and we can read them. Okay. All right. So there is an anonymously sent uh, question here in Slido. Um, let me read it for you, LA. Working with marginalized groups, if they are not comfortable in sharing data that we need to accomplish our humanitarian work, how should we position ourselves? So again, working with marginalized groups, if they are not comfortable in sharing data that we need to accomplish our humanitarian work, how should we position ourselves? So in, in that kind of situation. In the uh, humanitarian work, there is a concept that uh, 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 we follow. Uh, this is called the do no harm uh, principle. You know, sometimes uh, when we help people, we, you know, we, we may have in mind that we're helping them. But actually, some of the things that we do can actually put them in harm's way. Uh, one example is uh, the, the question, actually. What if, you know, uh, the people that we, you know, uh, when we're conducting assessment and then they did not consent to, you know, to the sharing of data, but we still share the data. And then, for example, uh, for example, the community that we conducted an assessment is a known 
uh, area of uh, let's say uh, our rebels. <laughs> and then you know if uh, uh, their personal information has been leaked, you know, to uh, those who you know uh, uh, want other uses <laughs> of that information, then you know, we are putting them in our way. So that means uh, uh, when we are working with marginalized sector, we always have to keep that in mind, the no, do no harm principle. Uh, when we collect data, for example, we always uh, use consent. We always ask for their consent. And then the consent, are, it has to be very, very specific. Uh, like, can we use your information, not anonymously, but uh, we will uh, compile it together with the other uh, people. Can we use your information? for our analysis uh, so that uh, we will be able to uh, make some recommendations on uh, how we could support you. Can we use your uh, information uh, for our uh, databasing so on and so forth? But all of this, basically, as much as possible, uh, what we do is uh, we anonymize. <laughs> if, if, the, if the specific person is, if the information is specific personal information is not necessary, we anonymize. So instead of you know putting a name and a person in as, at, at the back of that information, it becomes a statistic. It becomes a number. So that way, whoever comes up with this information will see numbers, not personally identifiable information. At the end of the day, if what we're trying to do is you know to send help to these people, uh, we just wanted to know where they are, how many they are, and what they need. Uh, there may be some instances, though, that uh, we need the you know personally identifiable information. Like for example, uh, the community leaders. Uh, this is for purposes of uh, revalidating, verifying data, so on and so forth. So it's a, a, a it's a case by case uh, situation. And again, uh, the principle that we have to follow is the do no harm principle. So everything we do, we have to think of the consequences, whether this may be. Are used in a different way that may put them in arms way. If uh, that will be the case, then we have to re-strategize. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, LA. There are two more questions in Slido, and I think that the last ones we will tackle for this uh, um, for this talk. Um, the other one is how is it working with people coming from different parts of the SAN? <laughs> right. It's actually fun. Uh, uh, so at the AHA Center, uh, while uh, our primary stakeholders are the ASEAN member states. We actually uh, have a, a wider stakeholder than that. So we work together with the UN. Actually, uh, before this meeting, I was in a meeting with UNOSAT, the UN Satellite Center. Uh, we were discussing about how to integrate AI into our flood detection models and analysis, so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I deal a lot with the UN. I deal a lot uh, with... Uh, the dialogue partners, we call them dialogue partners. Dialogue partners of the ASEAN are basically the countries that are providing uh, support. Uh, most of the support are financial to the ASEAN region. Like, for example, Japan, uh, the US, China, Korea, uh, the EU, Canada, um, Switzerland, so on and so forth, New Zealand, Australia. So there are many countries around the world that are very interested in disaster management in ASEAN. So they've been putting in a lot of uh, efforts, a lot of support into our region. And one of my job is, uh, of course, to uh, continuously uh, develop ideas, you know, uh, projectize how we could uh, improve disaster management in the region and then make a project proposal that we could share with the dialogue partners. And of course, once they supported this project, we have to continue this uh, uh, relationship with them. So uh, it's while I work uh, at the AHA Center, our staff are coming from most ASEAN member states. Right now, not all ASEAN member states have a staff at the AHA Center, uh, but most. And then in addition, we have secondis from, we have one secondi from the European Union, so on and so forth. So uh, how does it feel? Uh, it's actually a, a good learning experience because, you know, uh, especially here in Indonesia, you know, I, I get to learn some similar words, <laughs> you know, uh, like, uh, uh, Kanan, our Kanan is also Kanan in Indonesian. Number five, Lima is also Lima in Indonesian. Uh, utang is also Utang <laughs> in Indonesia, you know, and, and uh, there are some similar words, you know. So this is a good, very good learning experience, you know, exchanging culture, knowledge, a uh, language. Uh, 
In terms of a personal development, this is a very interesting. In terms of professional development as well, this is a very good because you expand your network. So again, uh, working at the at humanitarian organizations where you have to do lots of coordination, there is a huge opportunity for expanding your network. All right, we're down to our last question, LA. What are the milestones so far for the ADMER work program in terms of responding to disasters that occurred in the ASEAN region? So milestones of the ADMER. Yeah. If I tell all the milestones, I think it will be <laughs> another... A day. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I will just uh, uh, go on the uh, big ones. So at the ASEAN region, what we have what we call the uh, SASOP the Standby Arrangement SOP. So this SASOP is basically our SOP on how we coordinate uh, disaster management. And this is a fruit of uh, that admin. Uh, this one is not available uh, in many other countries. You know? One thing that I, that, you know, uh, when I was still in the Philippines, you know, we, we, we might, uh, we might you know, uh, look at ourselves, we might condescend ourselves. You know? We might think that, oh, uh, I think what we're doing in the Philippines is not good enough so on and so forth, so on and so forth. I think it's good at that level that we wanted to improve. We wanted, you know, we know we could do more, we know we have to do more, and we want to improve. I think that's good in that way. But if we look at ourselves, you know, like condescendingly, like, uh, in Philippines is what we do, only this, blah, 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 blah. I think we're, you know, if, if we zoom out, look at the bigger picture, I just realized, you know, I, I realized when, when I joined the international organization that actually, the ASEAN region has been doing a lot more than any other region in the world. That is why many government, many countries are supporting the ASEAN region because they see a lot of, of, of progress here. Another, re another reason, uh, another region that is uh, equally uh, uh, you know, uh, disaster prone as the ASEAN region is the South Asian region, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. But they don't have uh, the SASO, for, for example. They don't have something like this. They have something like the A Center. It's called the SARC, but it's not as operational as what we have. So A Center is, is a one milestone of the ADMER. So you know this this uh, A Center SASOP we have uh, Delsa, the Disaster Emergency Logistics System of ASEAN. These things the other region they don't have. These things we have in the ASEAN region. We have at the ASEAN region what we call the ASEAN ERAT. ASEAN ERAT is the ASEAN Emergency Response and Assessment Team. The ASEAN Emergency Response and Assessment Team. Uh, the, similar, the one thing that is related to this or similar to this outside the ASEAN region is UNDAC, United Nations uh, Disaster Assessment Coordination Team. So you see, uh, we, we, uh, the one related to us is already uh, global in, in uh, scale. Uh, we also have uh, what we call ACE program, a Center Executive Program. The, the idea of the ACE program is uh, uh, to train the future leaders of disaster management in the ASEAN region. Uh, to basically improve their thinking, their systems thinking, uh, so that when they become the future ministers, you know, the future USEC of, of NDRMC, for example, he already have an understanding, a deep understanding of the regional disaster management mechanism, global disaster me management mechanism, so on and so forth. This is a six-month program for uh, future uh, government officials, basically. In addition to what I've mentioned about the things that we do, like Armor, Aimnet, Adilab. Uh, these are the more recent ones. Uh, I think uh, also we've, uh, we did a lot of uh, in terms of emergency response, but uh, quite recently uh, when the 2018 Central Sulawesi earthquake and tsunami happened in Indonesia, uh, we, we did beyond emergency response. Uh, after that one, uh, the uh, people of the Philippines and the people of Brunei Darussalam donated some amount uh, to the to the people of Indonesia through the AHA Center. And our goal, our role there is to build the permanent houses for those people that get affected by the earthquake and tsunami and liquefaction in 2019. So we were able to establish uh, the, an ASEAN village in Central Sulawesi in Indonesia. And this is the first time that we uh, uh, did work related to uh, recovery and rehabilitation. Uh, this, you know, I, I could go <laughs> a full day, you know, talking about all of these things, but I think I'll stop here and <laughs> I'm being mindful of the time. Thank you again, LA, for providing those answers, not to all of the questions. I have uh, the last question, but perhaps you can answer through the chat box as we proceed through the next part of our program, if it's okay with you. Sure. 
Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Time. Thank you so much. Now, uh, let's proceed with the program to show our appreciation. Um, the PGS would be giving a certificate to our speaker for sharing his valuable insights and expertise this evening to our audience. And so let me read the content of the certificate. Uh, the certificate of appreciation is given to Lawrence Anthony de Maile for the valuable insights and expertise shared as a virtual resource speaker for the talk Making Maps and Saving Lives, the works of a humanitarian geographer as part of the Philippine Geographical Society Lecture Series 2022 held on October 24, 2022. This is signed by uh, Professor Joseph Palis, uh, the Chair of the Department of Geography, and also Professor Emmanuel Garcia, the President of the Philippine Geographical Society. So once again, LA, thank you so much for sharing your work, for sharing your insights and your experiences. We've learned so much, uh, not just about the AHA Center or the contribution of geographers in, in, in this particular line of work, but also the geography of collaboration and cooperation among uh, ASEAN countries uh, towards um, dealing with um, massive you know, and threats of, of disaster events. Okay, um, so following that, um, we will uh, proceed with our closing remarks. So everyone, please welcome Professor Darlin Gutierrez of the DUP Department of Geography uh, and also part of the Board of Trustees of the PGS to deliver the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Oni and LA. Thank you so much for sharing your work, your time, and all the stories that you have shared with us tonight. Uh, the department is really proud of you, no? And of course, uh, also Keith, uh, I think he's also with you there in, in, in Indonesia. No? And uh, thank you for your continuing uh, service to humanity. Actually, your stories have given more relevance to our upcoming uh, international conference on emotional geographies, which I think will be uh, announced later. No? And uh, well, this is just a short... Uh, closing uh, message now uh, again i would like to thank you for inspiring no for inspiring all of us now and for putting geography further in humanitarian practice and action so we are really uh, privileged to hear you talk tonight and i hope we you continue to collaborate with us and continue to inspire now our would be geographers who are here tonight and also the rest of, of us here. Okay, again, thank you, LA, and uh, take care. Okay. Thank you, Oni. Thank you, Ma'am Dar. Uh, I, mean, I now call on Mr. TJ Cipriano, also one of the board member, board trustees, board of trustees of the PGS to uh, announce. He has a few announcements from the organization. Thank you, TJ. Thank you very much, Ma'am Oni. Okay, so we have a few events coming up in the remaining months of 2022. First, um, Dr. Kirby Alvarez of the UP Department of History will talk about the historical context of climatic studies of the Philippine Weather Bureau on November 29, 2022 at 4 in the afternoon. Then on December 5, 2022, Professor Felipe Hocano Jr. of the UP Department of Anthropology will talk about Filipino martial arts and mobilities. His talk will, will be at 5 in the afternoon. We are inviting you to be part of the remaining PGS LS events for this year. And then we are, and before we end, the Philippine Geographical Society has a call for membership. You can visit www. Uh, phgeographicalsociety.org for more details. And if you want to revisit the past sessions of the PGS Lecture Series, these can be found in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. And um, in more than two weeks, on November 10 to 11, 2022, the International Conference on Geographical Studies will take place. We are all excited to meet researchers, scholars, teachers, and students of geography, as well as the allies in the field, to have a space for exchanging notes, conversations, and even find meanings on emotions, 
which is basically the theme of our conference this year. For those who have submitted their abstracts, please make sure to check your respective emails for some reminders and announcements on the upcoming conference. Please stay tuned in our, or should I say, please stay tuned to our social media pages for additional details or information on ICGS 2022. We look forward to your presence about online. Thank you very much.